gather them for the best, for the great battle of God Almighty. And the great battle of God Almighty is the battle of that we call the battle of, of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon is the is the final battle between good and evil. And this battle is being prepared right now. The devil is working with all those that don't want to follow God and is preparing them in the future to fight against God's commandment keeping people. But what they are really ultimately preparing for is hell because the devil cannot defeat God's commandment keeping people because it is not them that live but God that live. So when we read in chapter 14, we saw that the three angels' message is to be preached everywhere to prepare people for heaven. And now in verse 16, in chapter 16 of Revelation, we are looking at three fallen angels possessed with, possessed with, with falsehood, and they are spreading to all the world. In other words, just the same way God is preparing people for heaven is the same way the devil is preparing people for hell. Now the question is, what are the methods these two groups are using? And now this is where we go to Genesis. I want us to go to Genesis. Genesis is the first chapter. Genesis chapter 1. We are reading from verse 26. The Bible says, And God says, Let us be men in our image, after our likeness. In other versions, that word image is replaced with reflection. So in other words, God created us in his own reflection. But God did not create us in his own, in his full reflection rather. Because Ellen White says that the plan of God was that the more we live in obedience to God, the more we will have attained the fullness of the image of God. Better, or better yet, the fullness of the character of God. We could have thought like God, we could have think like God, we could have loved like God. If we had not seen, but that plan was crushed when men decided to see. But the good thing, the good news of it is that when men, even when men sin, God did not give up on the human race. He decided to devise a plan that we call the plan of salvation. Now the plan of salvation is composed of three, three methods, which we call the triangle of eternal life. Now these three methods are justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification is when God declares us innocent because we've accepted Christ. Sanctification is when we become holy. And glorification is when we are taken to heaven. Now, justification shows that we have a just God. Sanctification shows that we have a holy God. And glorification shows that we have a glorious God. In other words, the plan of salvation is the very nature of God. In other words, God keeps us from sinning by giving us His very own nature. Now, question. If God has a plan of salvation to keep us from sinning, then what makes you think that the devil does not have a plan to make us sin? Now, the devil comes up with everything that God creates, and that means the plan of salvation, or the plan of the devil to make us sin, is also the nature of the devil. In other words, when we decide to sin, we are embracing the life of the devil. Now, what is the plan of the devil. Yes. This is the plan of God, is the plan of salvation. If we read John chapter 3, verse 17, it says, For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world may be saved. Now if God's plan is the plan of salvation, then that means the devil's plan is the plan of condemnation. And this plan is also composed of three, three methods which are the nature of the devil. Now where in the Bible do we find the nature of the devil? Let us go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14, we are reading from verse 12. Chapter 14, reading from verse 12, the Bible says, How art thou fallen 
or how art thou fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast down to the ground with this wicked nation? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. In other words, that way star is the same as glory. So in other words, the devil thought he could be perfect without God. And because he thought he could be perfect, he thought he could be good without God, then he rejected the principles of God. In other words, he rebelled against God. So I look at two things, pride and rebellion. Now before the devil rebelled, the devil disbelieved in the law of God. And to disbelieve is to not be convinced of something's goodness in your life. In this case, the devil reached a point where he was not convinced of the goodness of God in his life. And because he was not convinced, he grew into pride, thinking that he can be perfect without God. And because of that, he rebelled against God. So we are looking at three things here. And, that is a, and those are the three methods that the devil used to make us sin as well. He makes us disbelieve into the goodness of the power of God. He convinces us by making us think that our lives are good without God. And because we think that way, we grow into pride. And when pride is reached, then we rebel against God. And when we do that, we are becoming sons and daughters of the devil. Now my desire, and I believe your desire too, is to be on the side of God. Now the question of greatest concern is, are you seeking the Lord with all your heart? Now before we look at, are you seeking the Lord with all your heart? We, in order to seek the Lord with all your heart, you are supposed to disconnect, or to, to disconnect the wrong connection. In other words, you are supposed to forsake all the things that make you not to seek God. And there are many, of, there are many things we can look at that make us not to seek God, but there is one that I want to look at that is mostly dis disregarded, and that is what we call comfortability. Now, comfortability is you being in a state where you think it's normal not to work. In other words, you think it's normal to be lazy. And I want to use two examples to, to bring the reality of that. Example one of comfortable people. These are people who, who grow into the perception that they cannot change. And because they believe that they cannot change, they grow, they, they, they relax in the comfort of them not changing. In other words, they look at the bad things that are happening in their life, the wrong things that are happening in their life, and because of all those experiences, they say, you know what, I cannot change. And because I cannot change, I will live in the comfort of being not changing. Now that is very dangerous because it makes you numb to sin. Sin will cut through you, and before you realize this, your whole body is in pieces. Now going to the example two, which I believe is the most crucial. Example two, these are people who think that they have made it in life. In other words, they think that they have completed the race of Christianity while they are still in the middle of the race. And this is demonstrated by the story of the, the tortoise and, and the, the rabbit. I believe we remember that story. The tortoise had won the race while the rabbit was the fastest. Now why did the tortoise win the race? if the rebel was the fastest. Because the rebel reached a point in his journey where, where he started looking at all the things that have accomplished, the distance that he has covered, and the distance that is between him and the target. And because of that distance, the rebel grew, grew to the perception that I have already completed the race. What? He was still in the middle of the race. And because of that, he became reluctant and later became, and later lost the race. And that is the reality of many churches today. Is that 
Fiul is there, who is there, the church, I would say the church was on fire, everything was going good, and because everything was going good, the church reached this perception of saying, you know what, our church is definitely going to heaven. And because our church is definitely going to heaven, let us relax. And in their relaxing, they became spiritually dry. Now what is most surprising is that in their spiritual dryness, they think that coming to church every Sabbath, or either getting tired, or, or, or having positions in the church of God, makes you to be in good and regular standing with God. And God says, I will vomit you out. And this is what is spoken of by the church of Laodicea. Let us go to the church of Laodicea. The church of Laodicea is found in the book of Revelation. Revelation, the third chapter. We are going to read from verse 14. But the verse that I want is verse 16. Uh, the name Laodicea means judgment. And Laodicea was the apostolic church, but prophetically, Laodicea is the last day church. In other words, it's the remnant church. And since we are the remnant church, then that means the message to this church is our very own. Now let us read from verse 14. Verse 14, the Bible says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodicean right, these things say that are men, and the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would, I would thou were cold or hot. So if then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now you see, if I drink water and I spit the water out and I say this water, is not cold or it's not even hot. What I'm, what I'm trying to imply is that cold water or hot water is better than the water that I just drank. And that is what God is trying to imply here. God is saying that to be cold or to be hot is better than to be lukewarm. Now what is to be cold? If we read Matthew chapter 24, the 24 verse 12, it says, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold, or rather it will grow cold. And we know that love is the fulfillment of the law. In other words, God even tells us if you love this, we are supposed to keep his commandments. So people that are called are people that don't keep the commandments of God. In simple terms, you can say the people that are called are unbelievers, or rather atheists. Now, God here is saying an unbeliever or an atheist is better than you, the pretender. So that means me, <laughs> me that is preaching here, but fail to keep what I'm preaching, I am worse than an unbeliever. Why? Because an unbeliever at some point of their life, they may reach, they may reach a, convic a conviction of wanting to surrender their lives to God. But you, the pretender, you won't reach that, it will be hard to reach that conviction because you think you've already surrendered your life to God while you have not. Now then, the question is, is there hope is there a way for me as a pretender? And God says, yes, there is a way because there is no problem that I cannot solve. But what is the way? I want us to go to the book of Luke. The book of Luke, we are going to read from chapter 18. And we are going to start from verse 18. 
de bază de spiritism, este de rulă Ask Jesus, Good Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And now Jesus thinks much enough, he does not directly answer his question. But he asks him, he answers the question with another question by saying, Why follows all the good that is not good, save God, save that is God? Now the reason why God is asking that, or rather Jesus is asking that question is because he wants to know if this man is calling me good because he acknowledges that I'm God in the flesh, or is he calling me good because he thinks that a man can be good in his own ability, or that a man can be perfect in his own, in his own self? And Jesus finds out, finds out the answer to the question in the next few verses. In the next verse, Jesus says, that knowest that they know the commandments that thou shalt not covet, that thou shalt not kill, that thou shalt not steal, that thou shalt not commit adultery, and thy father, and thy mother. And now the ruler being bold enough, he stands and says, These things have I kept from the day of my youth. Now after Jesus hears these things, he says, Yet there is no one thing. Go and sell all that thou hast 